Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to have an idea episode and we're going to be talking about prioritizing technology for Industry 4.0. And to help us walk through this, we have Brandon Mendoza, who is the Director of Sales at Odin Technologies. So welcome, Brandon. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Looking forward to going through this with you. And maybe we can just start by helping our listeners who may not be too familiar when they hear things like 4.0, because you do hear terms about smart manufacturing, digital transformation, 4.0, all these things, and they can be somewhat confusing. So if you had to sit down maybe to an eighth grader, somebody in middle school, how would you explain that to them? Yeah, no, that's a good place to start. I agree. There's a lot of buzz terms that are being thrown out there, and it can get confusing, quite a bit of overlap. When I think about smart manufacturing, industry 4.0, digital transformation, I try to simplify it down. It's really about combining smart connected systems with advanced analytics to enable data-driven decisions. And I'll use a quick analogy so that even an eighth grader would understand what I'm saying there. If you think about a car today and you're sitting in that car, that car has a variety of different smart sensors. So whether it's a sensor reading the tire pressure, the temperature of the motor, or various feedback on the electronics, those sensors are then displaying that information to the person in the car on the mobile device, might even have analytics running against all that data. And if you think about the future of cars going towards autonomous vehicles, you're going to start seeing predictive analytics and other ways to combine the data to really enable better decision making and in a car where it can actually drive itself. Today, it's providing information to the driver itself of, hey, there's somebody next to you, don't get over, or hey, you've, you've drifted out of your lane. But it's really using data to allow people to make better decisions and make those decisions faster. I love the car analogy. That definitely very relatable. And as we're seeing the auto industry change and, and evolve with the electric, and then like you mentioned, the autonomous car, that's, that's really cool. So now good foundation. Thank you for that. When you start working through some of these technologies, you run into headwind. So maybe help us walk through, what are you hearing out there consistently from a technology prioritization standpoint of headwinds that people have? Yeah. We actually recently did a survey and I was somewhat surprised to see that 76% of manufacturers say they struggle to prioritize industry 4.0 smart manufacturing technology investments. And at first that surprised me, but when you reflect on everything that's happening in the world, COVID, just like every other industry, impacted manufacturing quite a bit. And I think what it's done has really accelerated the need for digital transformation and so you have a lot of companies out there, you know, trying to accelerate their efforts and, and move quickly. If you look at the complexity of the various technologies that make up smart manufacturing, number one, that I think makes it difficult. The rate at which the technologies are changing is faster than ever before and will only continue to increase. When you look at these efforts here, it's really a cross-functional change across the organization. As far as driving alignment, and even once you pick the technology, actually driving adoption uh, and actually using the technology to create value by driving different behavior, there's a lot of things where it can go off the rails. So yeah, I, th- I think folks are struggling to, to prioritize, build out that roadmap, understand where to start, how to scale, uh, and everything that goes along with that. Right. Now you said it was at 76% of industry is struggling to prioritize? Yep. Yeah, we just did a survey about two months ago. And that that was the number that we saw. Wow. That definitely shows an opportunity. Maybe in in having conversations like this will help. So for the listener out there, Brandon, that that may be struggling and they're trying to evaluate from a technology standpoint, as you mentioned, where to go, what advice would you give them? Yeah, I always start with three questions. When we started this podcast, you asked me, what does smart manufacturing mean? And I think that's a good question to start with as far as what does smart manufacturing mean to your organization? What is the 
the capability or, or the thing that you're trying to drive with this idea of smart manufacturing. And then once you understand that, I think you want to understand how it could impact your operation. So what, what are the outcomes? What are the actions? What are the changes that you're trying to drive? At Odin, we talk a lot about the fact that value really isn't created unless somebody's taking a different and better action than before. So I, I think you really need to reflect on what is the outcome and what are the actions or behavior changes that we need in order to drive that outcome. And then lastly, just simplify it to what's stopping you from achieving that. So if you, if you know what you're trying to do, what impact you're trying to make, now reflect on what's stopping you from achieving this. And I think that's where sometimes it can get complicated because it could be infrastructure, it could be analytics, it could be visualization tools, it could be skilled resources, it could be funding, timing, all sorts of things. And that's where it can get complicated. I would look to you know leverage various resources out there, like you can do like a digital readiness to understand where you're at today and how that compares to roadmaps that are out there. Forrester, who's a, a third-party consultant similar to Gartner, just released a smart manufacturing tech tide last quarter where they evaluated the top 20 technologies and they broke it into maintain, invest, experiment, divest to try to you know more clearly define that roadmap. So there's a couple of resources out there that you could leverage, but I think you first have to, again, go through those first three questions that I ran through to understand what it means to your organization. Right. Absolutely. And, and we'll recap just those questions. What does smart manufacturing mean? And when I heard you say that, Brandon, I was thinking that may set the vision, right? Or help define the culture of where are we trying to go? The other two, how can it impact operation? That definitely you know speaks to the ROI and, and tying it all back together. But I like your last question, what's stopping you? Because that's where the rubber meets the road, right? And so from the rubber meeting the road standpoint, what are you seeing out there from leading companies that are successfully implementing new technology? What, what's setting them apart right now? I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek and in, in starting with the why. And I think that is very applicable here as far as companies that are successful. There has to be a really strong why ingrained behind the smart manufacturing initiative. Why are you doing it? And usually that relates to the problems that you're trying to solve and very clearly defined use cases and outcomes. I think a lot of times people assume that smart manufacturing means more automation and, and replacing humans with technology, but I think it's more so around combining humans and technology to make humans more productive, to allow us to make better decisions faster. And I think if you clearly define that why, why the company's investing there and how you expect that to impact people's roles and, and hopefully make their job better, I think you'll get that clear buy-in up front so people know what to expect and know why they're doing it. And then from there, I would say companies that I've seen be successful really focus on action and focus on small wins because sometimes a lot of these initiatives are really transformative across the whole company. And so it's, it's easy to get overcomplicated and make it a really massive, wide encompassing effort. And that's great because you, you might have a big impact in the end, but it takes a long time to get there. And that can be a little bit grueling for folks to go through and not see the results. And so I think companies that focus on driving small wins will help drive that adoption will help people understand where the value is and how it's going to improve their role. Think about how to make it sticky. At the end of the day, if the change or the technology or what you want your teams to adopt isn't something that makes their job easier and it becomes a burden and not something they see positively, it's, it's not going to be sticky. Versus if it's something that they become dependent on, relying on the day-to-day -day basis, and they realize, wow, this, this makes my job better. This makes me more productive it'll be easier to drive that adoption because they'll naturally want to use it. And I think the last point I'd put out there is because it's such a company transforming initiative, it, it really requires a cross-functional team. It can't be led by one single part of the organization. It, it has to be cross-functional to really work. Absolutely. To take us back for our listeners, it all starts with the why and getting that defined correctly. So I love how you said you focus on the action, the small wins. I tie that back back in the in the days for reliability that I used to support here at Eco. 
I called it control groups. Pick a small group of assets, focus on that group of assets versus trying to eat the whole elephant at once. Let's focus in on here. Let's win that. Let's win the day, win that battle. And then hopefully we're winning some advocates along the way. And like you said, making it sticky. And if you do that adoption, like you're talking about, really just starts to, to really grow and exponentially. And good point on the cross-functional team. So that leads me to my next question around the who. Because you think inside of the manufacturing environment, there are a lot of people, a lot of departments, a lot of people are usually involved with technology. Who do you see as being leadership roles in technology or industry porn photo type initiatives, things like that? Yeah, I think it's been changing over time. This is another one where I can throw some recent survey results at you that might be helpful here. On a recent survey, we asked that question of manufacturers. We said, hey, who's important to involve in that cross-functional team? And 90% of folks said both engineering and IT. So those are the, the two most common portions of the organization that are critical for smart manufacturing industry 4.0. Uh, operations was almost 80%, a close third behind the first two. And then next was digital transformation was around 50 to 60%. And then finally finance and HR. And, and I'll point out a surprising one here that's grown on me recently is Clearly, you can't leave finance out of the conversation because at the end of the day, the project needs to be funded and needs to make financial sense. But the HR one, which in our survey was only 22%, so you can see it's, it's a small percentage, I think is actually maybe a misstep that people are starting to understand and put more energy and, and action towards. I did a recent interview with, with Chris Lynn from G Healthcare, who leads up the HR side of this transformation effort for GE Healthcare. And he talked a lot about, again, when you think about what you're really trying to do, again, combining technology with people to really drive improvements, that people aspect is a huge part of the equation. And if you're not involving them up front, I think that's a misstep. And I think it's only going to slow you down or, or cause the adoption to not go the way that you want. And so now I would encourage folks, although HR teams, sometimes aren't invited to the table and tell people go to put it into action, I would try to invite them more up front so they can help understand how this is going to impact their workforce, help message it and get the why and the buy-in to their workforce, and then help create that plan to go execute. But yeah, that's the cross-functional team that we typically see. That's great. I definitely hadn't considered that. You think naturally to the engineering and the IT. I think anybody listening to this, if they if they're working with 4.0 or smart manufacturing, those are the two groups of people that we're seeing have to come together. That whole IT, OT convergence, that's a natural fit. But the HR, that's an interesting component. Good advice, definitely good wisdom there. I think it's something that we need to explore more as we evolve in industry and manufacturing and things like that. So thank you for that, Brandon. That was awesome. Yeah. There's so many things changing in the market right now. It's a lot of uncertainty out there on how, on how to invest and how to make decisions from a manufacturing standpoint. What would you say to a manufacturer out there right now who's trying to make good decisions from an investment standpoint? Maybe talk to that finance guy or that finance person. Give us some advice. Where would you go? Yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely a lot of market uncertainty. We're, we're in an election year. We had uh, the largest global pandemic. There's trade wars to a certain extent going on. So there, there's just a lot of shifting priorities right now. And so I think it's important anytime you have market uncertainty to focus on you know, what you can control and not get too caught up with the things that are out of your control. I think the two biggest themes that I've seen over the last few months as far as where manufacturers are focused on improving, it's really around improving operational agility so they can respond faster to changes in demand, as we saw with COVID, as well as operational resiliency. So that was another thing that was exposed to COVID was, hey, you can't operate the plant remotely. We're very dependent on labor or people being physically in the plant or, or close to one another. What's the next pandemic look like? What does a cybersecurity attack look like? There's several things that could, could expose a weakness within the organization. And then... I think it's important nowadays to, because of that uncertainty, to really 
to pilot the new technologies and prove out the value before you make a massive investment. Again, small bets, small wins sort of idea. I think when people are evaluating the technology, it, it comes down to you know ROI, meeting their functional requirements, a lot on time to value and payback, right? Again, small wins, how fast can we prove this out? And then I think that ties back to ease of implementation. I think folks are, are leaning towards more turnkey type solutions that doesn't require additional engineering in, uh, development after the fact where the cost and scope can start to grow. And then lastly, CapEx versus OpEx. Is this going to be a capital investment or is this something that you can build into your operational cost? So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, I mean, definitely. That was some really good stuff. I love the operational agility versus re resiliency. That is that is critical and it's definitely shown through this pandemic. The companies that were ready or that were in a better position to react because they, they had that mindset going in. And if you're a manufacturer out there, Brandon, and you really want to get going, and you've talked several times about trying to start with that small control group or just or, or certain areas and to really pilot things out and get them going. Are there any areas of low hanging fruit or minimal risk that manufacturers could start implementing right now? Yeah, there, there's many places to start. I, I think again, I'll, I'll bring us back to the fact that it's technology combined with people to make your teams more effective. And so I would focus on workforce productivity. Right, what technologies are going to get you productivity with your teams and drive that adoption? I think it's important to, as folks are making decisions to think digital everywhere. Anytime you can transfer something that wasn't digital yesterday to something that will be digital tomorrow, that creates more data that you can leverage and take advantage of. I think, again, starting small and proving out those wins before you scale. I think when you look at the smart manufacturing technologies, I, I referenced that roadmap from Forrester, and they did 20 different technology groups. There are some out there that are cross-functional. So I would think about starting there because you can get a lot of capabilities across several different areas very quickly. But I would also focus on technologies that are focused on driving actionable improvements. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of smart manufacturing technologies that add data, add reporting, add analytics, add these things that can almost be seen as like nice to have and, and something that sits in the background. I would focus on solutions that are really driving a workflow to action. So it's not just going to be this amazing report or analytics in the background. It's very built into your, your operations as far as driving a workflow that leads to different and improved action. And I think if you start there, your ability to, to drive a quick win will be a higher probability. You're looking for immediate impact, right? Or direct impact, rather, not immediate, direct impact to show how that technology has positively impacted your operations. I think you, you did say digital everywhere, man. I think we may be onto a t-shirt, Brandon. You, you want to go in on me? We'll, we'll market that digital everywhere. I love it. And uh, have, have that out in the manufacturing plants, man. What do you think? I like it. I like it. And one other thing I'll just add to that is, you know, so much of this is, is about data, which is great because the more data, the more potential to improve decision making. But it's also, I think what a lot of us are dealing with is like kind of system overload, right? So much is being thrown at us that we're trying to get good at filtering and, and figuring out where to prioritize. So I'd also focus on systems that do that for your teams. If they extract out the insight, the recommendation to improve production versus your teams having to build that out or figure out how to go extract that insight. So if you can find technologies that make a more turnkey ability to extract out the insight and the action from the data, I think that's where you'll drive success faster. That's so key, no doubt. And Brandon, you've really walked us through a lot of really good information, knowledge for our listeners today. We call it Eco Ask Why. We, we like to wrap up with the why. So from this topic of prioritizing technology for 4.0, why is having that clear roadmap so important? Yeah, there's always major shifts within industries, and, and we're definitely going through one right now in manufacturing when it comes to digital transformation, industry 4.0, smart manufacturing. And I, I see this initiative as 
probably the most important thing when it comes to continuing to innovate and differentiate manufacturers' capabilities and grow their customer value. At the end of the day, it all has to come back to you know, them providing more value to their end customers. And I truly think this initiative is going to be the biggest thing to help them grow their customer value. As we all know, you know, technology only accelerates the pace at which things change. And therefore, having a clear roadmap and making sure you're staying on the leading edge is important so you can stay in tune with that fast-changing landscape. And I think lastly, we talked a lot about how this is very transformative for an entire company. It's a big shift, big impact, and and it's cross-functional team. And because of that, it's very interconnected as far as the plan, the dependencies, the resources, the technologies. And so having that roadmap ensures that you have an interconnected plan that is is providing value in several different areas of the organization and is continuing to evolve over time. Right. I love it. That was that was great. Thank you for summarizing that up. A ton of value here for our listeners, Brandon. Uh, you definitely are, are top of your field. So, so thank you for taking the time with us today on Eco Ask Why, buddy. Appreciate it, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com. 